Thank you. Thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, welcome to we the last sure. talk yes. in our Change Every Day event series here in the green space in partnership with Echoing Green. I'm Shamita Basu, and we are ending strong with tonight's event, which we've called Keep Building the Movement, which is really an apt name for it because our two panelists are both working toward building a more just, more equitable future. And to get there, they have a really clear vision for the types of skill sets that the future leaders of tomorrow will need. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We'll have time for questions at the end. So please keep track of your questions. I hope you jot them down or just remember them. Uh, we will pass around a mic at the end of tonight's discussion so you all can join in and be a part of it. So for now, let's have a big round of applause and welcome out our panelists. <laughs> Okay, so I'll tell you quickly, this is the brief version of who they are. All the way to your left is Antoinette Carroll, founder, president, and CEO of Creative Reaction Lab. And right next to me is Yeshi Milner, founder and executive director of Data for Black Lives. So I want you two to introduce yourselves in just a second, but first, maybe we should find out who else is here in the room with us. So raise your hand if you're involved in a community-led organization or group of any kind. We have a couple hands, okay. Raise your hand if you work in the social impact world or are a social entrepreneur of some kind. All right, a decent amount of hands. And raise your hand if you're thinking about ways to combat burnout and stay motivated when the work gets hard, no matter what kind of field you're in. Wow, we are a burned out <laughs> crowd. Okay, excellent. It sounds like everyone is going to have something to take away from tonight's discussion. I'm really happy to hear that. Again, hold on to your questions. We're going to come back to you all at the end. Um, so now that we know a little bit about you, let's hear about our panelists. I want you to both start by talking about yourselves and the work that you do. Um, who wants to start? Yes, you want to start? Yeah, I can start. Uh, my name is Yeshi Milner. As Shamita said, I am founder and executive director of Data for Black Lives. We are a movement of over 4,000 scientists and activists working to harness the power of data and technology to make real change in the lives of black people. Simple, right? <laughs> Antoinette, you want to talk about what your organization does? I love how short that was. I, I know, you like were I very short You said under five minutes. Yeah, that's no, it. That's no, going to be the end of tonight's seconds. event after this question, too. So I hope you like what you said just there. No, we're going to get a lot deeper. We're Don't get worry. It to it. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Antoinette Carroll. I'm the founder, president, and CEO of Creative Reaction Lab based in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, but honestly travel so much around the country that I, I think I'm a nomad. Um, but I, She's running to catch a flight right after I tonight's event, to too, so right we need to this. let her go on time. Um, but I started Creative Reaction Lab in 2014 in response to the unrest in Ferguson, uh, especially being a former Ferguson resident, having just moved out six months prior to the unrest. Uh, but I also was someone that was active in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space, being head of communications at a diversity and inclusion nonprofit. And at the time, I saw a lot of fragmentation in my community. St. Louis is one of the most segregated cities in the country. And so I wanted to bring community activists together. I wanted to bring designers and creative professionals together, because I also am a creative professional, and have them come up with their own interventions to address the issue. Uh, we had a great response to that. They came up with their own interventions. All five were activated in St. Louis in a year, and that actually led to Creative Reaction Lab becoming an entity, uh, because originally it was just an event. There was no intention for mm. it to become a business. Uh, and here we are now about to come up on our five-year anniversary um, with the mission of educating, challenging, and training black and Latinx youth to address racial and health inequities within their community, because we very much believe that if we are going to address these issues of inequity, we need to work with the young people to make it happen. One, because most of the movement that we've seen throughout our history has been led by young people, mm -hmm. too, because they have that creativity, honestly, that fireness that we need, yes. and they haven't 
unfortunately been jaded by society <laughs> to think fresh, about what they can do. They're very fresh. Yeah. Um, uh, but then we also face the reality that the issues that we are addressing have been around for centuries. And if we only focus on people that are in traditional forms of power, we're actually not going to make the dent that we want. And so when we think about return on investment, which is more of a business term, young people will be the best ones to work with. That being said, we also acknowledge that we need to work with institutions in power to make it happen. So we actually have a duality of mission of deepness with our young people, but also breadth with institutions of power. Uh, to make the work happen. And so we will go into a little deeper of the movement we're trying to create uh, a little bit later because first I have to define a term before I kind of throw that out. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's essentially the foundation of our work. Great. Okay, now I want to go deeper. That was kind of the 30,000 foot view mm -hmm. of what you're aiming to do with your organizations. But now I want to hear what all those what all those big ideas actually look like mm -hmm. on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis. Mm -hmm. So Yeshi, do you want to start, I mean, on your on your website, on the site for Data for Black Lives, you have this mission listed, which is create concrete and measurable change in the lives of black mm -hmm. people by mobilizing scientists around racial justice issues. Mm -hmm. Can you talk, can yes, you explain what course. that looks like? Yeah, and I wanted you to go for a tangent on it because I love your story and I love how <laughs> you, you're thinking about place and design and mm -hmm. it's really related to what we're doing at Data for Black Lives and how we got mm -hmm. started. You know, like a lot of movements, it starts with the flash with the flashpoint. Yep. For me, you know, even though we officially launched in November 2017 at the MIT Media Lab with our first conference, Data for Black Lives started in high school. Mm -hmm. I was 17 years old. I had never collected data before, but I was kind of pushed into this because a um really kind of serious thing happened at a neighboring high school. Some young people organized a peaceful protest because an administrator had put a student in a, in a chokehold. Mm. This was in 2007. Video, you know, phone video images were still grainy. There mm -hmm. wasn't the same response around police brutality and certainly mm -hmm. not talking about it in schools. So, you know, I remember being at home um, in Miami and watching CNN and seeing on TV students at uh, Edison Senior High riot, mm. right? their peaceful protest was interpreted as a riot where, mm -hmm. you know, today we're encouraging young people to walk out of school, right? We're, we're, we're encouraging young leadership. But, you know, the, the response to black youth trying to speak out, trying to have a better, more safer school climate was sending in SWAT teams, yeah. sending in police cars. Um, yeah, so I kind of knew then that unless we found different ways of building our political voice, mm -hmm. of expressing our voice, our lives would continue to be under assault. And that's when I turned to data and data collection. Um, we, I joined an organization called Paris Center for Social Change. They were working on addressing the, what, what was happening in schools every single day, but besides these like police brutality flashpoints that we were seeing on the news. Um, young people being suspended for things like not having an ID, yeah. having the wrong t color T-shirt under their uniform, things that could be addressed with a phone call home, right? Getting pushed mm -hmm. out of school. Mm -hmm. And... Um, there was very little data on it. It wasn't until 2014, because of the work of the Obama administration, Office of Civil Rights Movement, that we got disaggregated data around suspensions and arrests and what was happening in schools, but we had to collect it ourselves. Um, we surveyed 600 young people, asking them their experiences in schools, um, and we turned all those findings into a comic book because we wanted mm -hmm. it to be accessible. We wanted to have it as a way to convince our school board, our superintendent, that we needed change. We needed restorative justice policies in our schools. We stopped funding cops and fund counselors. Mm. Um, but what more message were you sending with making it a, a comic book? I wanted to send the message that A, we needed this data to be accessible, mm -hmm. and B, you know, more important than shifting decision makers, when I saw a young person open the comic book and see mm -hmm. that, oh yeah, I'm getting suspended, like I'm not a bad kid. You know, like this is a statewide, nationwide problem mm -hmm. and it's called the school to prison pipeline, mm -hmm. you know? And years later, I found out that our comic book, even recently, I found out that our comic book was being used in Knoxville, Tennessee, and Chicago, and New Orleans, That's because awesome. young people were facing the same issues, because mm -hmm. again, this is a nationwide problem. Um, and they wanted to fight back and organize in the same way. And I think from there, long story short. No, no, I'm gonna ask you for it. Can you tell people what the name of the comic book oh, is? Oh, telling it like it is. Miami students speak out against the school to prison pipeline. Okay, cool. Yeah, right. so anyway, you know, I was hooked on data, you know, and the power 
of what could happen if we put data in, in the hands of people who are directly impacted. I went to college, I went to Brown where I met my co-founders, and my whole focus there was to just get as many skills possible in data science and research that I can. And you know, because of the open curriculum, you could do whatever you wanted. And I was like, <laughs> you know, I was taking like sculpture classes and like electronic music classes, but also like biostats and like quant, you know? But that's exactly I that. what I needed to do because I think, you know, it actually gave me the skills, right? And I wanted to be able to bring it back to Miami and I got an opportunity like really immediately after I graduated. Um, this time, not working on the School of the Prison Pipeline, working on something that I really knew nothing about, which was maternal and child health and black infant mortality, mm. right? We were in Miami and black babies were three times more likely to die before their first birthday than white babies. You know, I came back to Power Youth Center, the same organization. We had a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the grant was up. And they were like, okay, you have all these fancy skills now. We just need you to finish the survey so that we can not have to give the money back and close our doors down. And I said, okay, I'm going to finish the survey project, which was about asking moms their experiences in hospitals, in particular, our public hospital, which is the largest public hospital in the country, Jackson Hospital. And I said, let's, let's do the survey, but let's try to, let's, let, let's try to really fight for this campaign. Mm -hmm. What we were seeing was that what was contributing to black care, mortality was happening in the hospitals. The overuse and of operations like cesarean section, the aggressive marketing of infant formula, and just an overall environment where like literally people would send in their loved ones to go give birth and they would not return alive. Mm -hmm. Like this was happening. Mm -hmm. So again, a situation of, it was me and a team of like some moms, you know, I was 22. I, I, I was, had a college degree. I was feminist. I knew nothing about breastfeeding, knew nothing <laughs> about infant mortality, nothing about that. So that was a learning curve. And then there was this reality of like, wow, I had no idea that talking about breastfeeding as a racial justice issue would be so political. The mm. kind of opposition we came up against, especially with hospital staff, even like local breastfeeding coalitions, even talking about infant formula, because WIC, Women and Infants and, and Children's Program, that's the largest buyer of formula in the country. Mm -hmm. So this was like serious, but collected 300 surveys. I wrote a report. I think I wrote it on like Microsoft Desktop Publisher. I didn't even have like Photoshop or like the nice tools oh, I have sweetie. now. Mm. I know. And <laughs> With a little bit of media attention, mm. one Miami Herald article, after years of, years of trying to even get the hospital's attention, they called us because we had the data. Mm -hmm. And when we got in that meeting with the, with, with, with the new hospital CEO, the new director of obstetrics, all the new staff, because everybody else got fired, <laughs> when we got in that meeting, I knew that while we couldn't you know, bring in 300 black moms to talk about their experiences, they couldn't deny the data that we collected. You know, and I and, and for me, that's that's but so so I was at that place in Miami where I was like, wow, I'm able to really witness the power of data to make real change, like real concrete policy change, like to really speak for people who have no voice, who've been marginalized and to uplift issues that, you know, obviously have not been policy priorities. But but I also knew that the reality was very different. We were at a place where algorithms were being weaponized, you know, through risk assessments, FICO credit scores, mm -hmm. all the way to facial recognition being used to militarize schoolyards and borders alike. Mm -hmm. And I said, in a, in, in a world where, in a history, a country where data has been weaponized against black people, how do we make data a tool for social good? And I was working at colorchange.org, working on a um, project where we were building the first online petition platform for black organizations and black individuals to launch political campaigns. Um, that was my job launching that, and I said, okay, I know all these people who are so excited about the movement for racial justice, want to be involved. This was also 2016 election time, you know, who are working at hedge funds as quants, who are working at, you know, Boeing and company and, and Instagram and as researchers, but wanted to get involved, wanted to use their skills, but didn't know how. They didn't have an entry point into the movement. I also knew a ton of scientists, sorry, activists, organizers, educators, who, again, with a little bit of data capacity, would be able to do so much. And it just made sense. Like, what would it look like mm. to bring these two communities together, to break down the silos between scientists and activists? And we didn't know how to start. We said, let's have an event. <laughs> let's say, OK, we're not the first people to be talking about data for good. We, we might be among the first to talk about data for black people. But um, yeah, we launched with our first conference. Nice sold out within a week of opening up tickets and that's when I kind of knew that we had traction mm -hmm. and that's that 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 we were onto something and I you know two sold out conferences later you know a whole network being invited to speak at the UN and 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 
working on amazing campaigns around you know, against Facebook and, and, and all this other amazing stuff. The most important thing is the way that we've been able to really, I think, um, change people's relationship to data. Mm. So you're talking That's about cool. data literacy and data as a tool for change. Mm -hmm. Antoinette, I, I see you in the work that you're doing as, mm -hmm. as thinking about design and mm -hmm. systems thinking as mm -hmm. a tool for change. Yep. Can you talk a little bit about that? And there's this term that is just so interesting to unpack that I need to ask you to define it. Um, Equity-centered community design. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So first I wanna say, that was amazing. <laughs> like, yes, I love it. <laughs> it was so good. No, that was really good. We're going to talk after this. <laughs> well, because um, it's inspiring hearing that because admittedly, we also use data just not as well as you, uh, to be honest. Um, so at Creative Reaction Lab, we pioneered a new form of creative problem solving called Equity Center Community Design. Uh, but first, I want to define design, because most people, when they think of design, they think of the chairs you're sitting in, the clothes you're wearing, the logos. Uh, but design is actually, like IBM defined design as the intention behind an outcome. Mm. They didn't say the intention behind the creation of a chair. <laughs> they said the intention behind an outcome. And at Creative Reaction Lab, we built upon that definition and said it's the intention and unintentional impact behind an outcome. Because for us, it's not enough to just talk about intentions. We have to think about what's the impact of what we're doing. And when understanding that definition, we then had to face the reality that everyone is a designer and everyone is affected by design. And yet many times we don't call designers to the table when it comes to a lot of these social ills. When you look at our society, it has been literally designed by designers they create something out of nothing every single day. They navigate complexity, and yet they are not at the table when it comes to the complexity of a lot of these inequities or inequalities or systems of oppression. And we have this mindset that um, if systems of oppression, inequalities, and inequities are by design, that means they can be redesigned. And so we're trying to create a movement of redesigners of justice that we're calling equity designers. And equity center community design is centered to that. This process really focuses on the reality of not only making, but making is very important. That action piece is key. Because a lot of work around equity tends to be around competency building and awareness building, mm. and not to the space of action and what does it actually tangibly look like. But for us, it also thinks about what is the role of history and trauma and the role of power dynamics in everything that we do. Whether you are writing a policy or you're literally just assessing your own biases that you may have. History and power is everywhere. Yes, yes, yes. And I tell people all the time, your, your trauma doesn't go away because you decided to prototype something today. It is still there. Mm. And so we've, in a sense, and I, I tell people all the time, like we put a name to it, but I would argue there's plenty of people out there that's using equity center community design. There's plenty of people out there that are fit, that equity designers. We're just trying to put a framework around that. Uh, and using that framework in our work of death with our young people, we have our Design to Better Our Community Summer Academy, which we work with high school students, and they develop their own interventions looking at racial and health inequities. This past summer, we had uh, high school students develop their own own student-led mental health podcast. They develop their own short film. They reimagine school assemblies through a health equity lens. And they decided that they were going to create mid-year backpack fairs that thought about economic injustice for youth of color. And these were high school students from the schools that most people will call the bad schools. I'm a product of those schools. And yet many times we don't think about what power, creativity, what effect that they can make in their community. And so we have created programs that gives them the space, that gives them the funding to actually bring these ideas to life because again, that action piece is very important. But then we also have our community design apprenticeship program that puts the mindsets of community organizing mm. and equity center community design together. And so for young people. For young people. Right, right. Um, but with, with that program, it's actually college age students. Mm -hmm. And we say college age because we don't require them to be in college. That is a barrier in itself many times when we say, oh, we're looking for yep. college yep. mentors. Well, there's mentors <laughs> that are the same age that brings their real world living expertise to the table that really will create a larger impact. And so in that program, um, for instance, last uh, spring, our cohort was looking at public transportation access and how that's impacted life 
life expectancy and quality of life in a historically black community in St. Louis. Yes, that was very long. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, no, that's not what my look is about at all. I was yeah. like, I'm, a, I'm a transportation reporter now. So that's, uh, that was me lighting up. Like, ooh, we have You're to talk like, about oh, that You're like, oh, here we later. go. <laughs> that's what that look like. Because it was one of those, in St. Louis, we right now are looking at a potential light rail expansion. Mm. We are nowhere near where New York is at. Like, nowhere. Like, seriously, not even yeah. a blimp. And I know you all sometimes question New York. Imagine living in St. Louis, okay? <laughs> it's a reason why we all drive. Um, but, you know, they're looking at this potential multi-billion dollar expansion. Uh, they were hosting town halls and saying, we're doing community engagement. And yet, in the communities in which we were going, most of the people did not know that it even existed. They didn't even know that this was a possibility of what was going to happen, um, let alone what it can mean to them. Because some of them started to ask questions, well, will this bring in gentrification? What would this mean towards businesses here? How will this help us or will this hurt us? Mm -hmm. um, and our youth in that program was the one that led that entire campaign. They did the, the mm -hmm. entire effort and it was beautiful um, and frustrating. And this mm -hmm. is why I say frustrating because <laughs> As stated, we could just focus on death. There's a reason why we focus on breath. After the youth did all that work, conduct, conduct, um, received all that data, actually gave it to the consultants, the consultants decided that they were no longer going to focus on that stop. So that stop is no longer in the proposal for the light rail expansion. Mm -hmm. And I was very annoyed, <laughs> to be honest. But even now, I'm constantly talking with groups, including people that work at the light rail, around how do we address what tends to always happen to communities like this, mm -hmm. where you maybe give an opportunity and then you take it away and give it to more affluent communities at the same time. And so our equity center community design process is centered to that and this reality of us trying to get you to understand that they can be equity designers. And I'll define equity designers because I know it's like a term that I'm just throwing out, but we want people to move beyond this language of change making. And no offense, Ashoka, we, you know, I love y'all. But <laughs> I do work with them as well. But, you know, we want people to move beyond change making. We want people to move beyond even the label of global citizen because a lot of it tends to be very passive or mm -hmm. honestly labeled with white supremacy mindsets and savior mm -hmm. complexity. And so for us, when we talk about equity designers, we're talking about how do we have people put people and equity first? And understand that many times even when we talk about human-centered efforts, we look at humanity as if it's a frame on a comic strip, as if it's just that one moment in time and then there's nothing else that's there. And that's why that equity piece being equal to it is very important. How do we actually work with people to be embedded within the community in which they're working for change? Because when they come up with these interventions, it's going to affect them, hmm. just like it affects the community that they're working for. How do they use basic design practice of iterating, making, testing, and understanding that failure is a privilege, let's just say that out loud, and if they have that privilege, how do they leverage that on behalf of a community that maybe cannot fail because they have mm -hmm. to put food on their table, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But then also, how do they work with the cultural assets and the resources that are already embedded in that community opposed to erasing, which is what tends to happen? And then lastly, how do we leverage that lived experience with the inequity? And when I say that, many people kind of clutch their pearls a little bit um, <laughs> because unless you don't wear pearls then you clutch your wallet or you clutch whatever you want to clutch but you know many people on both sides kind of have issues with that some people are well I want to help why I don't have lived experience but I still want to help mm -hmm. that's when we say okay well you can be a design ally you can be someone that still have a lot of the frameworks we said, but you may be indirectly connected to that community, but you leverage your power and access on behalf of that equity designer. And then the other side is that people may say, well, why is it the responsibility of the people that have been historically oppressed to do the work? It's not. We believe that we need both the design allies and the equity designers to get that work done. Mm. Because when you have one side that has traditional power and historical power, they tend to assume and have prejudice and archetypes of what they believe something should be. And then if you have a community that historically don't have power, they don't have the resources and assets to actually amplify what they are trying to do. So let we need both you, to make it happen. Let me ask you both a sort of related question mm -hmm. to that, which is that I, I'm, I'm thinking about the work that you both do as 
um, empowering communities that have been traditionally and historically disenfranchised, affected negatively by systems, unfair systems that have been in place. Um, what do you do by way of support for that? I'm imagining that burnout can oh, probably you're be personal something here. personal and, and oh, for the people oh. who are, are <laughs> working in your organizations, the people who uh -huh. you're saying it's so important and crucial for them to be part of this process and to yeah. be equipped with these tools you're both talking about. Um, mm -hmm. How do you support that? You, you talked a bit about trauma and, and mm -hmm. how it doesn't mm. just go away because you're at work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, even in, in our process, that's why we say history and healing. Mm. You know, even for some of our programs, we have discussions on what are those healing moments that we're going to integrate within this and not just have it be working sessions because that's important um, and we don't think about that. I tend to start from a point of personal experience, uh, personal vulnerabilities. I'll admit I don't really know what balance is. I personally out of my side it doesn't exist <laughs> mm. but that's my own failure that I'm working through um, and I I'm one of those where if I'm burnt out I will say I'm burnt out and and say that it's okay if I'm tired I'll say I'm tired and then take the time that I need to take mm. and even within our organization we built in structures to try to counteract that for instance we don't require everyone to come in at the same time every day how many people show hands have to be at work at 8 30 or 9 o'clock at the same time every day yeah i see some people like ooh, <laughs> you know and one of the things we do at our organization that we even think about different personality types or different ways in which you live your life and so some of my staff member every day of the week, like Monday through Friday, they're there at 7.30 and that's their schedule. I have staff members that come in at one and they're there at one every day of the week and that's their schedule. Mm -hmm. And we've built that flexibility within to be conscious of the reality that we all need our time and we need things that will help us be successful and understanding that this work is hard. Mm -hmm. We don't, at our organization, we don't have limitations on, va on vacation days. You know, I actually encourage my staff to take vacations. They yell at me for not really doing as much, but <laughs> I encourage it. Mm -hmm. You know, we have holidays off such as, um, actually March 21st was the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, right. which mm -hmm. most people are not conscious of that. And we actually have that off as a holiday. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have integrated these processes within our organization and also different processes within our programs to help people along that's in that step mm. um, but then we also allow them to give us feedback on what they need uh, because there's times where I've been at events and they say okay we're all everyone you know they in facilitation are like everyone stand up we're gonna have this moment of like shake it out but what if someone is physically inaccessible and there you now created an unsafe space for them because you haven't asked what they actually need mm. to be successful and to thrive. And so a lot of it also comes from that communication piece as well. Mm. And Netflix is my friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she, what about for you? Yeah, you Support know. for yourself and also support for the 4,000 now, you said scientists, <laughs> lot, yeah. data scientists who are part of your network. Yeah, I, I think about this a lot. I, I think about it, you know, in our work at Data for Black Lives, we think about work in general automation, 40% of the jobs are gonna be automated. Mm -hmm. How are we thinking about work in the future? Mm -hmm. In my own life, I think about how do I create, how do I change my own relationship to work, right? Mm -hmm. And for me personally, part of that was, okay, you know, after our first conference, I realized just how many people's lives were attached to this vision that I had. Yeah, the stakes this, feel very high, yeah, right? Like and personal. This, this idea I had, Data for Black Lives, and actually seeing these people who are coming to the conference, who are working in places where they feel isolated, yeah. where they feel alone, where they're in their laboratories or in their offices or in their you know, libraries at their institutions, and they want to feel like they, they belong to something, you know, especially given the political context and how much the world's shifting right now. So when I kind of realized just like how important the space, the physical conference space, but also this movement was for people, I said, I really have to focus, take care of myself. And I remember at, at AFC a long time ago, maybe two years ago, Cheryl got on stage and talked about how she had a kind of self-care realization and got a trainer and started working out and really taking care of herself. And that really resonated with me. Mm -hmm. It did. Because I knew that 
whatever I was doing had to had to flow from within yeah. outward, mm. right? Yeah. I knew that the work that we were doing was about data. It was about changing, you know, narratives. It was about pushing back against power structures that seek to weaponize data. It's about, you know, possibilities too. But I, I knew that I needed to be in a place to hold that. So I moved to Arizona. And <laughs> as one does, I moved to Arizona. I traded my apartment in the West Village for a house with a pool. Oh, yes. And which was cheaper because it's Arizona. And I'm and a Midwest I, girl, so we like our space. Yes, <laughs> I'm telling you. And having that space made a difference, you know. And I started lifting weights three times a week because mm -hmm. I needed to feel stronger. Because mm -hmm. while I was lifting weights, I'm also writing open letters to Facebook on behalf of the Did <laughs> for Black Lives movement. And I'm, you know, interacting with Eric Schmidt and all these folks who are interested in the demands that we're making and, and, and the ideas that we have. And I'm pushing back on a lot of energy, right? So that was a sacrifice I had to make. I had to leave New York. That meant hmm. I can't come for coffee. I can't speak at your conference. I can't come to this meeting or conference that I really want to go to. I'm so sorry. You know, and I, and I said, okay, you know, how do I try to spend more time alone and in quiet. Mm -hmm. So much of my work is thinking about technology, thinking about innovation, thinking about big data, and, and, and I love that, but I needed to be in a space to also be very creative, right? Mm -hmm. To make these bold demands on behalf of our movement and to be a servant in mm -hmm. a way, right? Servant leadership. Mm -hmm. So that was, a, so my spiritual practice, weight training, mm -hmm. it was like very intense. And I think, you know, that was the best thing that I could have ever possibly done. Mm -hmm. It really, seriously, mm -hmm. um, for myself, but also, again, for our movement. When we have our conference, and you know, we, we just had our second one where it was like, we doubled the number of participants, over 600 people sold out, crazy. It's probably gonna be triple that size next year. People care about whether or not it's on time, the schedule. People care about whether or not the food's good. They care <laughs> about that stuff, but like what they really care about what they really are looking for is like what it feels like and if I'm in a bad mood and snapping on everybody that's not good okay mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how great the conference is if I'm burnt out and I can't react and treat and, and share love with people then it's not worth it and when I hear people stand up on Sundays at our conference when we have our like you know reflections and they say that they feel love in this space. Mm, yeah. They feel like they belong. Yeah. They feel fed and nourished. That's why I have to be in the gym three days a week mm -hmm. and why I have to wake up at 5 a.m. And, and pray and meditate, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because um, of this work. And also, I think for me, too, like you said about history, most of my actual daily work as ED, I love being on calls. I love like talking to students and talking to researchers, but it's reading a lot of history, mm -hmm. <laughs> reading and reading mm -hmm. and reading and relearning, but also unlearning. Yep. And that's like a whole psychological process yep. in itself. Mm -hmm. Can I ask so, you both a question? Is there a book that you've read that you found really crucial to the work that you're doing? Just one, choose the one that you feel like has really, really changed the way you think about your work. Actually, it wasn't a book for me. Ooh, okay. Uh, was it, it was, a comic book? Those are a lot too. <laughs> We do buy comic books in our house. <laughs> um, uh, it was actually a, a documentary, which was uh, 13th oh, um, yeah, on Netflix. Yeah. And it was one of the first times that I actually live tweeted something. Wow. Uh, I kept pausing and was like, oh, we need to get this out here. <laughs> yeah. um, because it made me reflect on the lessons I was taught in school and the lessons I was not taught in school. Tell folks a quick um, little just so thirteen is a documentary. The Netflix size version of what the preview is of. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you know, thirteenth is really just talking about the thirteenth amendment and how um, mass incarceration is essentially now essentially the legalization of of slavery again. It's another way to get around um, how we abolished or emancipated you know everything, um, but. The thing about 13th is that it really made me understand that, because I'm a film nut, that's why I said I was more of a documentary person, that even as someone that loves film, that came from media, um, I wasn't aware of a lot of the historical kind of efforts that were put in to make certain com our community, black communities in my case, um, look bad and have the certain stereotypes. Like I grew up hearing, you know, do you all like chicken or watermelon? You see this um, culture of fear against black people, mm -hmm. but there's really no like in school explanation of it. Okay. It's yep. you learn mm -hmm. about slavery, yep. 
happened. You learned that mm-hmm. slavery ended. You learn about civil rights. You learn that Malcolm X and Martin Luther King was murdered. And then I'm pretty sure now they learn about President Barack Obama. That's pretty much it. You know, like some schools have a deeper engagement, but usually you have to take the African American history elective course. Um, And it was never really a a framing or a narrative that taught me about even war on drugs or like Mm -hmm. my family was were huge Clinton supporters. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, I remember my grandfather saying, I was raised by my, by my grandparents. Um, my grandfather said, you know, he was the first black president. Because, <laughs> you know, we didn't think we were going to get one, so we were going to just pick <laughs> Bill mm-hmm. Clinton. Um, but then, you know, it when you look at the decisions that were made by him and other presidents mm-hmm. that actually put us in certain predicaments that we are now, um, it was all things I had to unlearn. And then had to learn, you know, relearn other things. I mean, there's books like The Pedagogy of the Oppressed and like mm-hmm. things of that nature. But it was something about that documentary that clicked for me, mm-hmm. uh, which, I, yeah. I mean, and I want to highlight that this was important for me to even watch because I don't watch serious movies when I get home. I do so much work similar to you that is so hard. I'm looking at data. I'm thinking about statistics, life expectancy, all this mm-hmm. stuff. So when I get home, I want to watch a sci-fi. I want to watch an action movie. I actually get upset when there's character development. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> Just, None of that stuff. I don't want any of just, that. Just you know, and my explode. husband drives him up because he's a drama <laughs> person. I'm just like, oh, you know, but because I have to, like, I'm looking at a lot of this real world, so I just want to have the moments of just, mm. oh, you know, I don't want to overly right? those parts of your life. And so yeah. for me to actually say I'm going to watch this documentary and for me to continually reference this is a big deal mm. Um, mm. that I just wanted to highlight <laughs> in that moment. Yeshi, do you have something that for you really turned a corner? when you read it or consumed it? Mm, yeah, you know, I just read so many books. So I, the first thing that came to my mind was, it's actually like an O'Reilly book. This is like a series of data science manuals, but this one is very different. It's, it, it's called Doing Data Science by Kathy O'Neill. Kathy O'Neill is a data scientist. She was a former quant at a hedge fund, got involved in Occupy Wall Street, mm-hmm. and then became one of the most leading voices talking about algorithmic bias and data science. Mm-hmm. And one book she has called is called Weapons of Math Destruction. But um, <laughs> you can I, laugh. Though. Yes, <laughs> it's a good book. I highly recommend it. But also, but dinner. doing data science was incredible because mm-hmm. she talks about first of all the fact that you know as a data scientist, someone who is a PhD in math that. There was like a definitional crisis in the field, but it's one of the only Mm -hmm. data science manuals that I can think of where it actually is clear. It's easy to read, but also um, just 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 the way she talks about it. Right. Is very different from kind of the corporatized branded version of data science that Mm -hmm. unfortunately is contributing to a lot of the issues that we're dealing with now. Mm -hmm. So I highly recommend Mm it. Mm. In terms of, other than that, you know, most of the books that I've been reading and things I've been thinking about, you know, you, you're talking about housing and segregation. It's about segregation, right? Mm-hmm. One of the biggest issues whenever I go out and speak, I like half of my presentation is history. And, you know, especially in data, you know, zip code is always yep. a, a field, right? It's, 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 it's always, but what's encapsulated in zip code, right? Mm-hmm. Zip code you know, is a product of like U.S. Postal Service trying to reorganize society to distribute mail. But if you think about residential segregation, 1933 Mm -hmm. homeowners loan corporation maps, which Mm -hmm. areas were hazardous, which were desirable, which were best, those very same areas today, you know, generations later are, have some of the lowest outcomes, have been disinvested and neglected and, you know, have 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 had to deal with the brunt of aggressive public policy, you know. So when we say it, you know, we always say that zip code is a proxy for race, right? And talking to data scientists and researchers about that, it's like they're like, "Oh my God, I had no idea this whole time." But mm. again, that's why like reading history and taking the time to unlearn it and unlearn is like one yeah. of the biggest things that we emphasize and why for us in our movement, political education like is a mm. big part of leadership development. Mm. Um, That makes me think a lot about what you were saying earlier also about sort of lived perspectives and what you bring to a a topic and to a conversation. Like when I think about data and when I think about even um, 
systems that we accept the way that they are mm -hmm. there are certain people and certain groups of people who are perhaps privileged to think of them as being objective even something like data to mm -hmm. think of it as being objective mm -hmm. is a privilege yeah. mm -hmm. because all data isn't objective right i mean we mm -hmm. know this story oh i was thinking about mm -hmm. something yeshi that you and i spoke about earlier um about data being used as a tool of oppression mm -hmm. and one example that we discussed earlier was was um predictive policing yeah. which is a method used by some law enforcement agencies yeah. that uses data and analyzes mm -hmm. patterns to um in theory predict and prevent crime now it's being used in the bay area now oh, several other places yeah. there was a recent nyu school of law and ai now institute study that was put out saying that predictive policing systems run the risk of increasing discrimination in the criminal justice system if they rely on so-called dirty data. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about this idea of, of dirty data and I guess the purity of data? Yeah. And Antoinette, I'd like you to think about this also in, totally. in your work, the idea of purity yeah. of, of thinking and design approach and design and system thinking. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, when I talk about this, you know, we always say that like, uh, you know, in this country that we have crime data, but we really don't really have crime data, we have arrest data, right? So, mm -hmm. and who's arrested? Mm -hmm. For in this, I mean, do we even need to get into that tip right now? But um, <laughs> we just talk about 13th. You know, for example, right, like, you know, like, right. So yep. there's a lot of missing crime data mm -hmm. because a lot of people are committing crimes, but they're not getting arrested. Correct. So I don't know what the marijuana legalization situation is in, in New York right now. I have been in Arizona. And, <laughs> um, Happily but, been in Arizona you know, not taking our calls. Right. Like, white yep. people smoke weed, I think what the data is more, if not, like, just as much, if not more than black people, but they're not arrested every time they smoke weed, right? Mm -hmm. So when we're thinking about these predictive policing systems, like literally predictive analytics is using historical data, building a model off of that, and creating predictions out of that data. In the terms of predictive policing, some of the sort of proprietary companies that own these models, Predpol, um, Palantir, mm -hmm. Um, you know, again, you can't really, you don't know, we don't know what's in the models because they're proprietary. We would, have, we, we would need a gang of lawyers, if that, to even get under the hood to see how they're using this data. Mm -hmm. But the whole point is, for example, one of the um, Predpol products in Chicago that they used was called the Strategic Subject List, where they were creating a list of young people, young black people predominantly, who were gang members in order to kind of identify who were the most at risk or whatever. For uh, predictive policing, they use uh, hazardous zones and they map where these hazards and zones are. You know, when the hazard, the predictive policing map hazardous zones of today were like the hazardous zones of the, you know, homeowners, co homeowners corporation maps of 1933. Literally, it's the same thing. So when we're talking about what's feeding these models, it's data that's based on biased policing practices, <laughs> an overrepresentation of particular populations. And when you build a model off of that, what are you going to create? You're going to reinforce those systems. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's really dangerous. You know, another example is um, child welfare algorithms. I've been doing a lot of speaking mm -hmm. around the country and working with groups who are social service organizations trying to counter this. Uh, we have child welfare services organizations. Allegheny County, upstate New York, uh, sorry, Pennsylvania, uh, recently Chicago, but they totally dismantled it. They were using um, child welfare data to predict risk and which young people were the most uh, vulnerable for harm or whatever. And social workers, instead of being trained to you know, use their instincts and, and know how to spot things and da 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 da, and they were using an algorithm. So every morning, an email would come in their inbox like rating the likelihood of like with 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 scores and showing them like this 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 young person or that per young person is like likely to die yeah literally like that's how it, it was being done and in the process young people who actually were really vulnerable children who were actually really in harm were totally ignored by the system mm -hmm. and again it's a question of what's in the data right all of this predict all the child welfare data that that was being used wasn't reflected of everybody in the in, in the city who's using um, child welfare services, right? Like not everybody. So if you're a wealthier family and you don't, you're using private 
services, private ch uh, child care, uh, private counseling, you're mm -hmm. not going to be actually reflected in that public data set. Mm. So again, it's reinforcing and reinforcing these disparities. And it came at a really big cost. Over 15 children lost their life and they had to readjust the whole system um, and bring in a whole new, bring in whole new leadership and all that other stuff. But, you know, and again, recently we were working with some organizations in Ramsey County in St. Paul where it was announced that they wanted the uh, city of St. Paul, Twin Cities, Ramsey County Sheriff's Department were going to enter in what, what was called a joint powers agreement to create using publicly available, sorry, not publicly available uh, agency data, government data to create risk ratios to figure out which young people were, again, most at risk and allocate services or whatever. Mm. In the context of the school to prison pipeline, in the context of a city where Philando Castile was killed by police and there still has not been justice for his death, risk ratios would only be reinforcing already existing structures that are harming communities. So to that point, Yeshi, I mean, how do we how do we work with these bad data sets, essentially, right? I mean, what's what's the fix? What's a solution that you see as being possible? Can I add, can yeah. I just yeah. jump in before we get to that fabulousness? Um, we first have to face the reality that our technology, our data, all of that comes from humanity. And that every single person is a makeup of everyone else's biases. And we, when we don't acknowledge that, then we're going, going to continue to point to, well, that tech is bad, that data is bad. Mm. And we need to actually look at the, the root cause and the root kind of um, place that a lot of this is coming from. And so, you know, I was looking at a video a few months ago in which it was a former uh, Google individual saying that they're now trying to create one billion smiles because they recognize that you know, data it could be skewed, but it also could lead to better world, and, you know, tech could lead to this and blah, blah, blah. And when I was looking at it the entire time, I was thinking, I don't think you've really thought about where a lot of this come from, because tech, data, a lot of this is just amplification of who we are as human beings. And when we look at the child welfare system, because... <sighs> When you talk about child welfare system, it, it feels, I, I get a little flustered a little bit. And just being, I'm very vulnerable. I'm a very vulnerable, vulnerable, transparent person. So when my kids were born, um, I want to say maybe they were one or two. Um, I came home. My son had a rash around his neck. I took him to the hospital. I was then considered a child welfare Listen. case. Hmm. And I, my husband and I had to go through the system um, where we had to leave, live in separate homes, I had to go through therapy, all these things. And there's so many cases that I, what you just said, I've seen where children were in abusive situations, oh, but right. nothing ever happened to them. And my sister, her son, literally, she, her son was in daycare, his leg was hurting, she took him to the hospital last November, so not even a year, and she became a child welfare case. And what made me so frustrated, like at that time, it really made me start reflecting a lot more about my race because we've gone to that same hospital so many times, it's not even funny. But every time I went, I always had on my business clothes because I came from work. The one time that I went when I was just in regular jogging outfits, it's the time I have a child welfare case. And so even when I think about data or I think about tech and you know we talk about how it's, it, it, I think it's amplifying the prejudice and the isms mm. that we have against people. And it is creating continual trauma that is affecting communities at a level that, I'm gonna be honest, I don't know if there's clean data. And I would love your answer on this. Mm. Because when I hear it, I'm like, is there such a thing? Because we all, have things we have to unpack and unlearn, and a lot of us haven't even taken that first step to do mm. that. And yet we are like, but I'm an expert in this area, so I can build it, I can make it, but yet we're not an expert on ourselves. And because we're not an expert on ourselves, a lot of the things that have been taught to us through generations, because this is generations of knowledge that we have, is now being seeped into these platforms that's putting it out and expanding it even more. Right. And so I love to hear if it exists, 
But mm-hmm. for me, I just this is the one time to- one time where I'm not an optimist. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, it's the one time where I'm just like, you know, like even school to prison pipeline, like a lot of it is language barriers. There's biases there. I went to schools where there were security guards and metal detectors. You know, a lot of these people now work at big, like people that went through a product of these schools, they run big corporations, but most people don't know they came from that because we, a lot of them hide it. Mm. Um, but, you know, it's, it's one of those where when I was in school, yes, there were kids suspended. I had family members that were in jail, but not once did someone tell me it was a thing called school to prison pipeline. For me, it was you were suspended, family members in jail. That's okay, normal. that's normal. normal. Yeah, that's <laughs> you normal. know, um, mm-hmm. and that's partly why we are doing so much work in the community with young people, with living experts, or looking at community members as living experts, because these things affect them at so many levels. But yet, we even put up barriers of access mm-hmm. with the language we use or the tech that we use mm-hmm. that don't even allow the community that actually are dealing with these issues mm. to be a part of, you know, one time you hear me say the term solution, because I never mm. used that term, but part, <laughs> part of the solution. The solution, right, you know? Right. Um, so yeah, you you can get back to answering that question. Yeah. I just had to jump in on <laughs> yeah, that. Thank it you. Just, I mean, it's, 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 it's a perfect segue way. to what I'm gonna say. Yeah. I've been recently, as I mentioned mm-hmm. earlier, we have a campaign that I started to abolish big data, right? This is a demand that we're making. We're thinking about how do we abolish the practices and the structures around big data that has made it very powerful, very, very harmful in the hands of only a few people, right? For example, one of the ways that we're thinking about that, I mentioned our open letter to Facebook last year. I wrote an open letter to Facebook on behalf of the Data for Black Lives movement, really demanding that you know, the same ways in which Facebook gave unfiltered access to folks like Cambridge Analytica, Christopher Wiley, Alexander Kogan, mm-hmm. give black researchers, data scientists, and black communities access to our data. If you go on research.facebook.com, they're able to answer questions around housing prices and disaster preparedness and even influenza mm-hmm. epidemics that we mm-hmm. do not have the act, we, we have no way of being able to use that kind of information. But mm-hmm. because we have the lived experience, because we have real research questions that come from the community, what could we do with Facebook data? And I think second too, going back to the story around what's happening in St. Paul, we were called in because they were like, hey, we need support. A, we need our folks in the community to understand when they say big data, joint powers agreement, how are they trying to sugarcoat something that can actually be extremely harmful and, mm. pra- and potentially deadly for our communities, right? Mm. They're trying to organize, they organize a coalition between natives, native communities, black folks, Latino folks, and called it the coalition that, to stop the cradle to prison algorithm, framing it as a cradle to prison algorithm. Mm. I came in mm-hmm. and helped do sessions around what is an algorithm? How is this history embedded? Strategizing with folks. And it was announced about two weeks ago that this joint powers agreement is being totally dissolved, mm-hmm. right? That's what we mean when we say abolish big data. Now the next step is to think about how do we equip these same folks in the community with the tools to use data, collect their own data to ask questions, right? Real yep. questions that need to be asked before we try to bring an algorithm and put it on top of a school to prison pipeline and in years of inequality and disinvestment, let's address this in a quality. Mm -hmm. Let's figure out what solutions, what do people need? People already have the solutions. These demands have been articulated multiple times, but it's about listening and it's about implementing, Mm -hmm. you know? So I am excited about the possibilities with machine learning, blockchain, with, you know, even what can be possible in terms of mobilizing people through social media. I've seen the power of that. But at the same time, you know, we need to be really critically thinking about What are the ways, what are the agendas that are currently at work (laughs) that we need to be challenging, but also what is our agenda? How do we use data to create a world where everyone's needs are met? Mm -hmm. We're gonna pass around microphones in just a second, so I wanna get you mentally prepared to ask your questions. But one thing that I'm thinking about as you two are talking, uh, another similarity that I guess I see in both of you is that you're both focused on work that sort of emphasizes the power of seeing a singular experience as part of a greater system, Mm. as part of something bigger. Um, Can you talk a little bit about the work now of of sustaining the movements that you are working toward building Mm -hmm. and what that looks like? What does it look like to actually keep people 
energized, feeling a sense of urgency, feeling a sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be transparent. It's been difficult. Yeah. Um, It's been difficult because, especially in the communities we're working with, there's a lot of competing things that's that's there. Mm -hmm. You know, they... They have to work. They have to. They're trying to get education. They're trying to take care of their family, um, and many times, a lot of the efforts that are asking community members to come to come together are asking them to come together for free, mm-hmm. and asking them to come together around your time. And <laughs> like, there's so many different barriers there um, that even at Creative Reaction Lab, we started to add into our budgets, whether it's through earned revenue or through grants, to what we're calling the Living Experts Stipend. Uh, That's where awesome. we mm-hmm. pay people, even if yes. we're talking to you 10 minutes, we're paying you for That's your time great. because your time is valuable. That's um, great. You know, meeting them where they are. But it's that it's a struggle because as a small startup organization, you know, we're still fundraising. We're still, and many, I, I literally talked to some of the leaders in like the design space, and a lot of them do a lot of community work. And, you know, I've, talk to them and say, well, why don't you have living experts on your team? And they're like, well, what, how, do, how do we do that? And I'm like, what, I don't, what do you mean, how do you do that? I don't understand. Mm-hmm. And, and I was like, well, why don't you pay? Or they'll say, yeah, we work with a group of students at a community college. I'm like, why well, are you paying them? Mm. What, well, how do we pay them? Well, include them in the budget like you include your stipend in the budget. Like, That's right. <laughs> you know? A budget's um, value. And so it's a lot mm-hmm. of unpacking of that and mm-hmm. acknowledging all these different competing things that – uh, right. individuals have yeah. that yes while the mission is extremely important to me or the mission is extremely mm-hmm. important to you you know at the end of the day they still have their lives and they have their purpose and their passion and so a lot of the work that we even when we start workshops at creative reaction lab or our youth programs um actually even when i interview people for positions whether it's volunteer or board roles because we do uh, open uh, open board call so anyone can apply to be on our board um, I start with having them do a pledge on what they want to do to make their community better. Mm-hmm. And I do it not just, you know, so I can say, well, now go do this. I do this to actually understand who they are and what's their passion and what's their purpose and then how do we fit into that and how can we support you with that. I have my staff where I'm like, okay, you have your passion and purpose, your pledge you did. How is Creative Reaction Lab helping you reach that goal uh, and understanding that we should be assisting you and not just vice versa. Mm. Um but it is, again, it, it's, these are small efforts. It's hard to um, amplify that, especially with limited budgeting. And, and I know it's interesting that I shouldn't, well, no, I'm going to bring it up, doggone it. Here's why. <laughs> um, because a lot of organizations that do this work, they're the least funded. Like it actually, That's data true. has mm-hmm. found that mm-hmm. social justice um, organizations are least funded than anyone else. You know, and there's times where I've thought about changing my messaging. You know, should I say we're an education organization? Should I say we do this? And all every time it always goes back to, okay, well, what does racial equity even mean? And I'm like, if I have to explain that to you, you're definitely not going to find us. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, but it's, it's one where a lot of the people that are doing the work on the ground, that's why I, that's why a lot of them are called grassroots. I don't think it's because they necessarily want to be just grassroots because how do we even define that term? As a lot of them want to amplify that work, even if it's deepening it in the community, but they don't have the funding to do do it. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when we're like, how do you sustain a movement with, for instance, Black Lives Matter, or even I'll just say Ferguson, I'm not going to speak to Black Lives, I'm just speaking to Ferguson. You know, there's been efforts on the ground in St. Louis where we had the fourth of Ferguson, uh, well, Ferguson uh, Commission Report that led to fourth the Ferguson organization. We had the new mayor come in and say we're going to create a deputy mayor role for racial equity. We have organizations that everyone's talking about racial equity, and yet the young people that were in front of the movement, because it wasn't me, and it wasn't a lot of the people that are in the position of power or have stages right. like this, a lot of them are still in the community trying to figure out how they're going to survive. That's right. They are not giving access to those positions of power. Literally one year after Ferguson, they did a one year later um, panel, and it featured all white, older people of, uh, in leadership saying, Ferguson, one year later. We had, like, we had these roles that were put out, and yet the individuals that were doing this, and some of them actually lost their lives because there's been a, I would all yeah, call it an academic of the Ferguson protesters. Yeah. I think we're up to number six now targeting of Ferguson sure. protesters yep. that have miraculously died Mm -hmm. 
are they're all still trying to survive mm -hmm. and so it's hard to sustain a movement when you are fighting against the system that usually is used to sustain mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. a difficult piece mm -hmm. uh, but i will say that's also why creative reaction line parents earn re revenue because i even told my staff we are not going to change what we're doing just to fit the need of a philanthropist. That's right. Yeah. Because if that's what what we're doing, then we shouldn't be doing this work in the first place. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. Yashi, do you have thoughts? Yeah. You know, for us, earlier you said meet people where they're at. I think we do. I think about this in kind of three ways. How do we build this movement? Even before starting Data for Black Lives, my focus was always very organizational. Like I didn't do any fundraising around programming because I wanted to focus on infrastructure. And I know people fundraise for programming, people wanna like kinda tell you what to do. <laughs> and that wasn't gonna happen. So, <laughs> and I needed room to grow. Like we needed room for this like baby to become like a toddler. So in terms of how we're thinking about our movement and the infrastructure, which is the people and the relationships, you know, you talk about meeting people where they're at, right? We live in a world of identity politics and divisiveness and a lot of conversations. And just today I was talking to my co-founder, Lucas, and he was like, you know, I was listening to the radio and they were talking about how a lot of these political parties and kind of identity politics movements and things, they're like religions, except there's no love, mercy, and forgiveness. <laughs> I was like, that's so true, because you can't mess up. You know, you can't say the wrong thing, you know? And for me, I'm so lucky and privileged to have had access to radical political analysis, training as an organizer, as a high school student. Like, that's, it wasn't until I went to college and like, started doing this work that I realized just how valuable, like that was more valuable than a Brown University education, honestly, because, because that set me up to take advantage of another kind of intellectual space. People don't have that. Mm. So for example, when I was starting, even before Data for Black Lives, I remember my co-founder, you know, he's a mathematician. He was like always majoring math, always just wanted to be a math professor. And I always be like, okay, well, you, we, hello, we, math is like actually being we like weaponized. Like we need to do more around math. That like, why don't you just do something else? Like don't just be a professor. And he didn't understand what I was talking about in terms of like the racial bias, but you know, it was like from us kind of going back and forth, you know, steel sharpened steel, that like the foundation for Data for Black Lives came about, right? Mm -hmm. So now we have a, an or, a network of people who are white folks who have no exposure to understanding race, don't even, you mm -hmm. know, even understand race because again, whiteness is the norm. Like for folks who are people of color who are black are more conscious of race just because of the experience of being the other, right? Yeah. Much less thinking about histories of segregation and the three-fifths compromise and how mm -hmm. the very like electoral college, which is like the algorithm for our like political system is based on racism. So like, what do you do with that, right? You, you know, it's, you, you can't call people out. We have to call pe people in right now. Like we're not, we're kind of outnumbered here, just like numbers alone. Like we need to be more inclusive. So yeah. That's one thing. I think the second thing I think a lot about is actually equipping people with, with real skills. Like we want mm -hmm. people to come to our conference and come to our mm -hmm. events and feel good and have a great time and feel connected. But how do they actually go home with real concrete skills yep. that they can use, right? For example, I think about Latanya Abbas Wallace. Oh my God, I hope she's watching. And uh, <laughs> I was having a video to her and cool. she came to Data for Black Lives Conference, didn't know about, didn't know me, didn't know, just found out about it from Newport News, Virginia, mm. because she wanted to find a way, anything to figure out how to address gun violence in Newport News. And that's why she showed up. This year at the latest conference, she was a facilitator of a workshop co-hosted by Google, our main sponsor, on systems dynamics. And she was training other folks, other nice. educators, organizers, on how to use a engineering tool to solve social problems. Like that's what our work is about. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think lastly, I think about um, building a political home for people. It's not just enough to have skills, it's not just enough mm -hmm. to have like information. That's great. But like, how do we actually build a home for people? When mm -hmm. somebody tells me, you know, I work at Facebook and I am concerned, <laughs> you know, like how, I'm not gonna say any names, but like, how do I in these meetings when we're having real conversations about stuff that's impacting not just our 2.1 billion users, but the whole world, how do I step up and say this is racist or this is actually mm. illegal according to the Fair Housing Act, you know? They can, I can say things as founder ED of Data for Black Lives that they can't. Yep. The movement can take a position that yep. they necessarily can't. And we want people to know that 
even when you're in these meeting rooms or even when you're in these spaces, you're not by yourself. Like you have mm -hmm. a home behind you. Mm -hmm. And whether it's at the conference, whether it's in relationships with other folks who came, like that's what it's about, right? Like for me, you know, yes, we need to have the skills, we need to have the data, but we also need to have spaces where people can feel like they're mm -hmm. being like poured into and nourished and yep. developed. Yep, yep, that community piece is very much key. Let's take some questions, because Antoinette has to take a plane. Oh, yeah, in like 15 <laughs> minutes. Does anyone have questions? Just raise your hand if you do. And, oh, yeah, we've got a first Hi, question. Hi, hello. Thank you for coming out and talking to us. I have so many questions, but I'll pick one. <laughs> um, so just a, a little background, a question I've been pondering for a couple of months now, um, looking to do some research into it. Um, we talk about how black children are de depicted in media and how we're treated in educational systems and healthcare systems. A question I have for you both are, um, do you think, where's the question? Can our black children just be kids? Hmm. In this society? <laughs> yeah. I think that they can just be kids in our homes. Um, I, I do believe that, because I'm one of those people where I talk about, you know, we need to have dialogue, not debate. We need to be in those spaces where uh, people think different, different than you. But I also am on the other side that also believe we need those spaces to be safe. Um, because they're not necessarily the same thing. And uh, like I'm a mother of twin sons, you know, I, I want my kids to be kids, but there's also a reality that I had to have a talk with, mm -hmm. have talks with my son, especially after what happened with Ferguson. I had friends that had their kids out there protesting, I did not. Uh, that was a conscious choice for me, and I didn't think differently of my friend that took her kids out. I thought different ways of going about it, completely fine. Um, but I remember my son, when they first was talking about whether Darren Wilson would be indicted or not, and we were looking at it um, on my computer, um, when the choice came out or the response came out, I started crying. And my son asked me, well, mom, what, you know, what's wrong? And I was like, well, you know, a young boy was killed. Um, and he, then he said to me, well, mom, why, why don't we just call the police? And that hmm. was such a hard moment for me uh, because it was in that moment that I realized that I had to have that at least partial conversation um, that it's always hard to have to tell your sons that you may be viewed a certain way uh, just because you were born being you. But on the other side of that, I also tell my son, while some people may feel a certain way about you, you're beautiful, mm. you're a king, mm. no one can take that from you and own your identity and be okay with that. I am notorious for having music playing in my house talking about black, black, black and the beauty of it, okay? Just saying it's a great song. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, you know, I've started wearing more African attire. Uh, I've started to engage with people even from the homeland that I have no connectivity to because one of my own issues is that I don't know my own history, which very much bothers me. Um, but with kids, you know, it's, it's one where Unfortunately, as, and this is my opinion, as a black parent, sooner or later, you're gonna have to have the conversation in this society. Um, but I think you need to balance that conversation to allow them to still be children. Um, and surprisingly, they're already having the conversations, whether you're having it with them or not. I had my kids come home and refer to a student as white, and it kind of shocked me because I'd never mm. used, like referred race before. and. I was like, oh, where'd you hear that? And they go to one of the most diverse schools in our city. Um, when Trump was elected or when the elections was happening, they were coming home talking about political ideology. You know, <laughs> like, like it's happening. Um, and so, but at the end of the day, my kids are still kids. Mm -hmm. Like they actually mm -hmm. had my sons tell me, I don't want to grow up anytime soon because it looks stressful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. That's did you talk about real. burnout? Because that's <laughs> I talk real. about burnout, yeah. yeah. So it, it, it's having, you know, you can yeah. have the conversation. My son, one of his favorite movies, Black Panther, you know, um, but, you all, but also you can have yeah. a balance of it at the same time. Yeah, I think I'll add to that, you know, I think a lot about the risk. I've said that word a lot. When I, you know, one of the first, I, the first time I ever was told I was at risk, I was nine years old in the fourth grade. Mm. I wasn't told actually, it was a young girl, she, she was another ninth, four, fourth grader, nine years old, and she said, oh, I'm, I'm part of this after school program for at-risk kids, I'm, I'm at risk. I said, at risk of what? Like, what, what, what's going on? 
She said, oh, you know, pregnancy, jail, da 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 because that's the stuff that they told her in the program. And I'm sure mm-hmm. the program was actually fine, like, after school program. But, like, what are, what's the language that we use yep. when we're talking about young people, when we're talking about kids? You know, I think about risk a lot just because in the data world, you know, risk through insurance companies has, like, been, and, like, the actuarial process has been evolved into risk assessments for prisons, risk ratios for this, mm-hmm. you know, even risk in terms of lending and credit worthiness, which I talk a lot about and how that impacts folks. And mm-hmm. we have to eliminate this language. We have to stop yep. focusing on that. And we have to, even in, in the process of wanting to be there for our kids and wanting our kids to be innocent and young and free, like, how are we even reinforcing that through like programs or, or other stuff and you know mm-hmm. in the space of what 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 we do research hmm. yeah. let's try and squeeze in another question or maybe even two if we yeah, have time we but does anyone have a question more. you can raise your hand and mike will come to you no <gasps> you could oh, i'm about to say we did a great you job. get the last <laughs> yeah. of the questions so i think you know the topic is very grim and i know you're you know you're working through data and you know the your perspective on this is on a very deep issue something that you are fighting against history and my question is do you celebrate enough and you know and i know as a uh, somebody who's worked in the social impact space when you work in such a space it gets very dull mm-hmm. grim dark and yeah. you know you wonder where you're going and my question is when are those moments when you have stopped and you have thought, yes, I have made an impact? Hmm. I can go. What a great question I, to end on. <laughs> yeah, I can, you, you know, I always I'm told myself. With love. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I think one of the things, again, that being exposed to organizing and having this experience early on really taught me, like, I remember being in high school and being like, oh, I just love the work that I'm doing. I love being an organizer. And honestly, if all I do is impact one person, if one person's life is different because of what I'm doing, that is enough for me. When I was doing that hospital campaign, I said, if we got one mom to breastfeed, if one baby grew up and was breastfed for at least six months, preferably a year or two years, <laughs> like that would be huge. That would change their health, their life. I mean, it impacts IQ and so many different things. And I think that intention has gotten me so far, I'm telling you, because you know, it's turned into me actually like that being multiplied, right? And I think for me, when I hear that one person say, wow, I had a mindset change because Mm -hmm. of something that you said, Mm -hmm. what will that mindset change in my mind turn into? New ideas, new solutions, new relationships for them. That's going to be like that ripple that, that, that we need. So, I, you know, I mean, yes, I'll celebrate, you know, well, it was also my birthday, March 28th recently. That was, I definitely celebrated that. (laughs) But like that, that's what I, like, that's what I hold on to. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so you know i'm i'm one of those people i'm a drops in a bucket type of girl i think that you know for because i've had a lot of people ask me you know you're trying to address equity you know that's something we've never had how do you maintain i'm like well you know i look at everything that we're doing as different drops at different sizes yes, in the bucket yes, yes, yes. getting us closer um to that place of equity uh, and not necessarily saying that we just have one big drop that gets us at that 100 percent mark and so that has helped me uh in a lot of my work i'm not known for celebration as much when i make i try to laugh at everything clearly mm-hmm. um but so i i'm not overly stressed i don't try to take everything as seriously but i'm also not known for celebrating my own work which and i'll be transparent about that mm-hmm. i've I am the person on the team that celebrates my staff. Mm-hmm. Uh, we literally Sorry. just had moment a conversation where I could tell one of my staff members just so stressed out, and I'm like, I'm buying you brownies and hummus. And so we all started making jokes about brownies and hummus in the office. <laughs> you know, I randomly give them stickers on what they're excellent at. Um, when we were in the holiday break, I gave them gifts, and they didn't even know I was going to give them anything. Um, so I'm really good at it for other people. I'm not mm-hmm. so great at it at it for, for myself, but that's why my board actually is really helpful for me. I have particularly one board member. She is just notorious for it, where we'll be in the middle of a meeting. I mean, we have a time to do this. Like, it's like one hour. Why are we still talking, you know? But she always shuts it off and says, can we celebrate Antoinette for X, Y, and Z? Mm-hmm. Can we celebrate the team for X, Y, and Z? Because I will name what the team has done, but I will never name 
what I've done. Um, and it's great having those accountability people there to help you when that it may not be your area of strength. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that has helped me the most. I can't say I would probably change and start celebrating myself more because it's just not in my nature. Um, but having people around me that forces me to do it has been helpful. Mm-hmm. That seems like a great place to wrap up for the evening. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Please give a big round of applause to our two panelists, Antoinette Carroll of Creative Reaction Lab and Yeshi Milner of Data for Black Lives. This is The Green Space. I'm Shamita Vastu. Thank you so much. Thank you.